Thank you, Danny. Everybody, anybody wants to go to fun church this morning, I don't have any idea what they're going to be doing Having or studying. Fun. Having fun? Yeah. We're going to be lifted up with a blanket. Just try to keep it all under control, if possible. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Threading, uh, not just looking, continuing to look in the Gospel of John, but threading the last Sunday's sermon in together with this one. And uh, we're looking at the last week of Jesus' ministry and what he said and, and uh, the things that were happening. The, the writer, John, keeps telling us, well, it was the next day, it was six days from Passover, and Passover was coming, and they were doing this in preparation for this, that. So the, at the time, the, cat, the clock is ticking down, we would say, in the, the life and ministry of Jesus. This point, actually, was a part of last Sunday's message. Jesus said, he was speaking, and it's one of those cases where it sounds like he's thinking out loud. You know, have you ever said to yourself, self... And then just kind of rambles on. That's all right, especially when Jesus is doing it. He's going to say something. He says, now my soul is troubled. I don't know what is, as we say here in Alabama, bothering you. I, you know, you just think that's just a normal thing, what's bothering you. Everybody in the whole world doesn't talk like that. We might even take it a notch down and say, what's got your bowels in uproar? You know, that's, that probably shouldn't even be said in the pulpit. Amen. What's bothering you? Jesus said, I'm troubled. And the word that he used for trouble is one that uh, later on he's going to encourage his, his disciples. Let not your hearts be troubled. And it's talking about the waves of the sea. It's, it's what a, a sailor or a fisherman would use to describe choppy waters or a boat that was rocking precariously. Dangerous waters. My soul is right. And if Jesus ever had a troubled soul, then it's, it's all right for you and me to, to be upset by things or be concerned. I've heard some people say, well, worry is just a sin. Well, it's, it's not. Because we're such frail people. We don't know everything. We don't understand. We've mentioned that before. We don't understand. They didn't understand. Jesus says, why well, my soul is troubled. With all that he knew and with all that he was, things still caused him concern. He was burdened. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He knew that God could just snatch him right out. That God could remove him. That God could show up and, and come down. God can change anything. He can make your circumstances and mine. He can make them different. He can change outcomes. He can undo things that have already been done. God can do those things. And yet Jesus says, what, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? He says, no. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. I spoke with my Sunday school class this morning that God has a plan for our lives. He has a script for us. The, the challenge of the adventure is to find out, God, what's, what was on your mind when you made me? What, what was I made for? In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Pastor Rick has a question there in the first part. He says, what on earth am I here for? We know what, and then he clarifies, what on earth am I here for? We know that what he means is, what am I, why, why am I on earth? Why am I here? 
it is said that Mark Twain said this, that the most important thing, he says, what we'll decide about important things in our life, and he says, the first thing is to, to understand why we're here. And the second thing is how to get there. How to, how to get to why we're here. Purpose. Meaning. I don't believe that life is just a meaningless jumble of chance and happenstance. It's just a rolling of the dice, a, a draw of the cards. That things tumble out. I do believe in destiny and destination. I do believe in that life is a journey. I don't believe that we just bump around. I saw a, 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 a documentary yesterday that de dealt with a lot with uh, electronic games. And, and one of the first kind of popular electronic games was just the pinball machine. And sometimes the only thing electronic about the first pinball machines was the lights that flashed in. Uh, you made the bells ring and the uh, different things was because the, the ball bumped into it as you flipped the flappers or flapped the flippers. Pinball machine. The pinball machine, uh, machine almost went extinct when it got to a place where somebody said, where do we get pinballs at? <laughs> Who makes those? And somebody, somebody said, well, nobody makes those anymore. Well, what are we going to do? Somebody had to start making them again. Uh, they said it about a seventeenth of a pound steel ball, pinball. But it just bumps around and this bumper is made of rubber, so it makes it bump in and shoot up. This one, though, has kind of a ring on it. When you hit it, it's on a spring, and it'll throw it. And the ball goes in, and it scores points according to what it bashes into, bumps into. Life is not like that. Now, some people's lives are probably like that. They, they just put their head down, and they run headlong, and they bump into things. And when they bump into something that doesn't give, they just... Just take a step back and go in a different direction. They bounce off. I don't believe that that's what I want. I don't think that that's what life has to be. Jesus said, I came to this hour. This was why I came. Should I say, God, help me get out of this? Let me encourage you, as I did in last Sunday's message, and I'm going to leave this point. Grow enough and mature. Get, let your roots go down deep enough and your branches reach up high enough so that your very first breath of prayer is not save me. Help me. Get me out. Fix this. Stop this. That hurts my dad was awfully quick to want to have surgeries I, I never did understand he, the doctors come and said we're going to have to have surgery he said okay let's do it and I said dad do you remember the last time you had surgery you're a terrible patient first of all and my dad hated to hurt and every time someone would come in, he believed that everybody in the hospital who came in through his door could help him. No, sir, I'm just here to get some blood. And that someone else would come in and he would start telling them everything. That, he said, no, sir, I'm just here to give you your breathing treatment. I'm not here to fix you. I can't do anything. But I need some, I, I'm hurting. And they'd say, no, sir, I'm just here to, to uh, empty the trash can. <laughs> Daddy didn't like to hurt. He says, give me something so that I don't hurt. He knew that there was medication out there. He knew that there were things. I remember when I was having my heart attack and they kept shooting all different kinds of drugs into me and uh, didn't find out a lot. They were missing the vein every single time. All they were doing was pumping my muscles full of narcotics. And it hurts. <laughs> Wasn't funny then. Because we live in a fallen world, 
And we do not live in a, the perfect world that God created in the beginning. It's been changed. It's been damaged. It has been wrecked and recreated so often in our image that things very seldom are or very seldom work the way God wanted it to work. And that's why it's important. He says, let's get this train back on the track. Let's get this to work the way I wanted it to work. This can be different. This can be better, but it, it, it might hurt. If your shoulder's out of joint, they're not going to be able to put your shoulder back in the joint without it hurting. If you have a broken bone, they have to set it. They're not going to be able to set that bone without pain. Fixing things sometimes hurts. Jesus said that's what. Well. Now, let's look at the next passage. Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. Daddy just saying, to God be the glory. Now, God is not some kind of eagle maniac that wants us to always march around him, patting him on the back. But self-aggrandizement in our lives or glorifying ourselves or trusting in ourselves is the worst thing in the world that can happen to us. And he says, I need you to see me the source of everything that you need and are. And it's not a matter of me needing your appreciation or your approval. But I need you to do this for me. And that's really what Jesus is saying. He says, I could say, Father, get me out of here or stop this because it hurts. But he says, no, I want to acknowledge that I'm doing this because you want me to. Father, glorify thy name. Then there came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified and will glorify it again. And if you don't mind, close out this PowerPoint and you started up a, a, a video that I created by Charles Ritchie. Many years ago when I was pastor at the Vandale Baptist Church, that man right there, he wasn't wearing a tuxedo when he came to our church in Arkansas, but he uh, came to our church and he sang wonderfully at our piano. He's been singing for the Lord for all these years. And I've kind of kept up with his ministry. He looked young and he was just starting his music ministry then. And he taught me how to sing so many of the scripture songs that I sing now. Wonderful organist and pianist. time 
or it may have something that's drying up your bones. Jesus' prayer was, Father, glorify thy name. He's not just talking about bragging about God or patting God on the back or uh, giving God a, a much needed praise and approval. But it's just acknowledging. Remember there in the, in the Proverbs, in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Verse 5 says, In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And that's really what this is about. Acknowledging Him. In other words, saying, No, this is for God. This is God's plan. This is God's will. This is what God's want. He knows the recipe, and it won't taste right. Unless you follow the recipe. Terry and I went to, we, we haven't been away together in a, in a while, and we went uh, to Nashville for a trip. She was going to do some Christmas shopping while I sat in the car. <laughs> that was all right. She didn't hurt her feelings at all. But then we went to a very famous eating place there in Nashville. And uh, when uh, Avery and Addison found out that we were going, and they were very jealous and wanted to go. No, you can't go. And so for dessert, I had their, their signature meal, fried chicken. And then I said, well, I'll have some banana pudding. And it was banana pudding. And it was cold, though. Nobody should ever eat banana pudding that is cold. <laughs> if it's cold, put it in the microwave, heat it up. But I guess for the last 40 or 45 years, every time I've eaten banana pudding, almost every time, it's been because my mother-in-law made it, and she made it, and she took it right out of the oven and brought it to wherever our family was gathering, and it was still warm when I ate it. God says... That his banana pudding is the best. Because it's just exactly the way it's supposed to be. And not just because that's the way it's supposed to be. It's the, it is the way it will produce the greatest amount of good. And the greatest amount of wonder. And celebration. And happiness. And solution. And resolution. And redemption. God's will is not just, this is my way, it's my way of the highway. No, God says, it will work if you do it this way. This will make it do what it's supposed to do. It will, it will end well if you let me start it and end it. Let's go on to the next. The crowd that was there heard it, said it, maybe it thundered, or it said that an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit and not mine. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. We talk way too much about the devil, about the prince of this world. And Jesus says, what I'm about to do is going to drive him out. He's done. He's toast. He's finished. He's not an item anymore. He's not a property. The only way he can have any kind of part in your life is if you give him a part. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Let's go to the next slide, Andy. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will, will remain forever, so how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Yes, the Bible talked a lot about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And one of the names that was used to describe him was the Son of Man. And it's an unusual title because it's not talking about someone who is just a man or just somebody's son. One of my professors said something one time, Dr. Reginald Barnard, many years ago. He said this, and I'd never heard anything like it before because it had, it had an adjusting factor on everything that I believed about God and Jesus. Listen to this. When the Bible says the Son of Man, it's not just saying that Jesus was entirely, completely human, or that He was not different from other human beings. He was a man. 
he was born as a little baby. But the Son of Man is a messianic title. Dr. Barnard said this, and when he, when he said it, I, I raised my hand and asked him to say it again. He said, Jesus, listen to this, Jesus is not God's little boy. Jesus is not God's little boy. That's not what the Bible means when it says he's the Son of God. There is no one in the entire universe, nor has there, has there ever been anybody who is like Jesus. He is not God's son like I am John Bain's, John Walton Bain's son. I am John Bain's little boy, but Jesus was not, has never been and never will be God's little boy. It's not a human relationship at all. The Son of Man was a Messianic title when all the verses in the Old Testament that are about the Messiah and His coming are about Jesus. And in John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The, the words that are translated only begotten are the word words that literally mean one of a kind. Unique. He gave His one of a kind Son. Monogamous. You're going to have the light for just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. What he's saying is, is that you're being presented with an opportunity, and that opportunity doesn't last forever. The door is open, but it's not always going to stay open. I'm with you, and you can see me, but you're not always going to be able to see me with your eyes. Well, let's go on. I'm going to show you something. Believe in that light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. When he finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Now, that may seem to be like an, a, an inconsequential saying, but there were times when Jesus just slipped off, and it was important to him and important to everyone else that they couldn't find him. He hid himself from them. Jesus is not always attainable. Do you know what Isaiah records God as saying? Seek ye the Lord. When did he say? When he may be found. While he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. What's he saying there? There are times when you when he can't be found. And when he's not near, God reaches out. There are times, we call it striking while the iron is hot. In other words, uh, a metal worker pulls it out of the heat, pulls it out of the fire, and it's glowing red. That's the time to take it to the anvil. That's the time to begin to work it. That's the time to begin to shake it. Shake it. If you start saying, well, I, I'm just going to lay this over here. I'll get to it when I've when I'm in a better mood, or when uh, when I feel more inclined to tackle it. I'm a little bit tired right now. No, it, it's hot. You just took it out of the fire right now. Jesus said it's light now. You better get with it. You have an opportunity. You have a chance. But then he went and hid himself. Let me show you something. This is... I think a flavoring of what he's about to say next or what the scriptures are about. So look at this next slide. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. You know, something happened in my life. I'm generally a skeptic. Now, I love to watch all of these UFO television shows and finding Bigfoot. You know what that show is not about? Finding Bigfoot. It's just not. They go, there, there are people out in the woods that say, did you hear that? I think I heard something. Did you see that? Yeah, I think I saw it. It's a whole hour of that. Yeah. And some guy says, here is a picture that I took of Bigfoot. I said, you got to be kidding. That's not a picture of anything. The only film I've ever seen that was just really kind of 
head scratching was the Patterson and Ginman film that was taken. You ever seen that Bigfoot walking across that creek bed, swinging his arms? That's a little strange. Doesn't look like a man in a suit or a woman in a suit. It's a female, whatever it is. I'm a skeptic. I, I don't believe in leprechauns and fairies. I don't believe in fantastical things. I'm, the fact that I believe in God and that I believe in Jesus is just an amazing thing. It's, it, it's, it's miraculous. Because I've seen magicians pull rabbits out of top hats. I've seen women levitate and saw women in half. I've, I've seen magic wands produce balls and cards and scarves. And I think, that's really just tricky stuff. I don't believe you can believe everything that you see or everything you hear. I, that's the kind of person I've always been. When I became a Christian, though, it became astounding to me. I couldn't figure out why everybody in the world didn't believe in Jesus. I talked to my friends. I talked to family members. I preach. I sing. I've been around the world and gone places. And there are some people that have no interest in it at all. They not only don't believe, they don't even care. They don't want to talk about it. They don't even want to think about it. It says even after all these miracles Jesus performed in their presence, they still would not believe in him. I'm thinking, how can that possibly be? This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our report, Isaiah says, and to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? He says, who believed it? He says, only the ones that the arm of the Lord revealed it to. He says, not everybody is going to believe the Messiah when he comes because God is not going to reveal him to everybody. Let's look at the next slide. For this reason, they would not believe because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Now, he's not talking about the devil here. He says, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn, and I would heal them, God says. Isaiah 6.10. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about it. Let's look at the next slide. Yet at the same time, even many among the leaders believed in him because of the Pharisees. They would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogues. For they loved God, human praise more than the praise from God. There were some people who actually believed in Jesus, but they still wanted to be well thought of rather than to be thought of as a follower of Jesus. There are many people that I meet and people that I see, talk to, converse with, and that I share with, and they're, I'm wondering, why can't they see? I'm not smarter than they are. I'm not more spiritually astute or adept. I'm not sharper than they are. I'm not... Uh, God doesn't love me more than he loves them. I'm not a special person. I'm not above or beyond them. I'm not. Uh, and yet, I, when I saw the light, I reached out for it. I let it shine on me. I let it shine in me. It touched me. It changed me. And now I can't understand why others will not or do not believe, but I see that it's true. It's almost as if Jesus has hidden himself from some and shown himself to others. He said a few words and he kind of slipped out into the wilderness and he went out there and now they can't find him. Some people weren't even looking for him. When Jesus was here, when he was on planet earth, when he was conducting his ministry, John here marvels. He says, you know, even with all the things that he did. You know, when, they, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that was not something that 
brought them ultimately and said, that's, that's what we need. Now I can see this man can raise the dead. It was the straw that broke the camel's back that made them say, no, we're going to have to kill him. Because if he can raise the dead, we can't just argue with him anymore. We can't just say we don't believe in him. They were, they were already criticizing Jesus. Some of them might say, you, you mean somebody can give sight to the blind and you, you're arguing with him? You're disagreeing with him? What if he can raise the dead? You're going to point at a person who raised the dead and say, you know, he's, he's a fake. He's a fraud. He's not real. No, we're going to have to kill him. Jesus did do some of those things. It's like a, the sun is shining on wax and the wax becomes soft and mildable. And his sun, the same sun shines on the clay and becomes hard cracks, crusty. The same sun, the same light, the same heat. I say this, and I believe that's what this sermon says perhaps to you and I. If the light has shined in your life, if you believe in Jesus, if you know that he's touched your life and that he's a part of your life, and you find no difficulty in looking at him in love and faith and adoration, that means he has opened your heart and mind and shown himself, revealed him. He's unhidden himself from you so that you could see him and know him. You meet him. And even if Jesus was here today, standing in the world, and he could get on television, if he could get on Facebook, if he could get on a video or a movie, they would, you'd think, well, if you, Lord, if you would just come back and just talk to people and show them He's already done that. If you think that when, if Jesus would come back today and just talk reasonably to people and answer their questions and do miraculous things that the whole world would follow after him, they just would not. It would not be any different. One of these uh, sagas that they're showing on uh, streaming video is about uh, the lineage of uh, kings and queens in England. And one of the ladies uh, who was married to Henry VIII, the uh, mother-in-law, the lady-in-waiting to the king, said, I really liked the lady that you used to be. And the young lady says, and I can see that she was easier to kill. When Jesus comes back, he's going to be harder to kill. They just won't be able to. But that doesn't mean that they won't want to. Now, if Jesus were here today, he'd have the same reaction and response of the crowds to him. Whatever he said or did, there would be people who believed in him and people who did not. Jesus said, if you got the light, let it shine. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for your goodness to us and your grace. And I pray that as you shine in our hearts and lives, make us willing to respond, to give in, to give up. Instead of crying out for just help and deliverance, help us to learn to make our prayer. Father, glorify thy name in us and me. Because when you return... Those who are yours shall be gathered to you in a way that we can't comprehend. There will be an ending of all things of all time, of all human concerns. And the only thing that will matter is whether or not we acknowledged you, your plan, and your son in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Danny, what's our hymn of invitation today?